welcome to this session. I hope a great number of colleagues are still joining us. So the task that we were given by the organizers is to examine historic and cultural perspectives on contemporary conflicts and we should examine various events of European history and how, what kind of an impact, uh, positive or negative or neutral impact, they can have on contemporary society and politics, be it national politics, but for our perspective it is much more the international politics, European Union and various conflict situations. Uh, as uh, one of our speakers, time is limited, I shall limit my introduction as far as possible and uh, let me, however, uh, give a short introduction about the speakers, perhaps not the traditional way, because the data you can read in our small brochure. And let me start with uh, Catherine. Uh, so she is uh, uh, researching and uh, uh, teaching in Paris and CNRS. And as far as her position, among her many positions in the field of social sciences and historical scholarship, the most important is that she is president of the International Committee for Historical Sciences, which is the oldest and most prestigious organization of historians in the world, so we have to congratulate her for that. But uh, from a different perspective, I say that if uh, we have various forms of the survival of the Habsburg monarchy, uh, or Catherine is an embodiment of the survival, I think, of the Habsburg monarchy. She defines herself as one quota Hungarian, uh, uh, but I think she is a 100% uh, Habsburg monarchy. So all the positive aspects of the Habsburg monarchy, and if you look at uh, her oeuvre, uh, the most important, but not the most important, but uh, the last book is an excellent example of this uh, research attitude because as a colleague of mine defined this book, this is a transurban history of the Habsburg monarchy because instead of focusing on various nations or various part traditional ways uh, of approaching the composition of the Habsburg monarchy, she picked 12 urban settlements, urban towns, and looks at all aspects uh, of these towns, and this way she is introducing the complexity of the uh, Habsburg monarchy. But among other issues, she, uh, just as an exercise, she has also written one of the most interesting biographies of Miklos Horthy, the interwar Hungarian leader, so she is extremely diligent and extremely creative and always very nice to the colleagues. So the uh, next speaker uh, is Ahmed Evin. Uh, she, he, if uh, one wanted to list his uh, affiliations, that would be incredibly long. Therefore, be from Turkey via United States to Hamburg, then Germany, where he has spent, I think, perhaps most of his life. Uh, but here uh, I would like to point out that he kept moving between academia and real life and real business. So I think two of her, and that uh, quite unusual, I think, in a panel about memory politics, that we would have someone with this uh, type of experience because he is at home in various fields of life. And, uh, the third speaker is Gabor Demeter, who is a, who, a colleague of mine at the Institute of History, formerly of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And he is also a very complex, and I, to use the I ask word, out of the box type of researcher personality, because originally he is a geographer and historian, and uh, he is at home in both disciplines but he was among the first ones who started to develop uh, databases for uh, the Habsburg monarchy and also for the Balkans. And uh, in a peculiar way we could say, so he is not only a historian only who is searching for facts, but he is creating facts. 
in a way, <laughs> in a way because if you are using these, uh, uh, these databases, you can have access to information, pieces of information that otherwise, if you were just looking at selected sources, you would never get the information. Uh, so I think so much about the introduction, and instead of, uh, no, I have an about 30 minute introductory speech, but I'm going to skip that, because I think uh, it is much better to listen to our distinguished speakers. Uh, and first I should like to ask Catherine to take the floor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Attila. Um, it's uh, the book you you mentioned is my latest book, <laughs> not my last. I hope. <laughs> Uh, at, at the present time, actually, I, I, I cannot skip these complexity fields you were mentioning because I just started a new research on Banat. So, well, uh, from the <laughs> thank you from the, uh, in in the 19th century. So, at the at the um, uh, transition between imperial and national rule. So, how the uh, Hungarian state after the compromise. Uh, tried to nationalize uh, Banat in the in the Hungarian national project. So it's it's a very well. It's just starting. So um, it's uh, I cannot uh, reveal anything uh, uh, about this project uh, now. But maybe I will use some of these uh, topics about diversity, complexity, and and mixed, if not marriages, but uh, mixed identities to see how it can teach us something for uh, present day uh, Europe and European Union. Um, I have to uh, mention that there is a slight error on, the, on, the, on my affiliation in the, in the program, not in the biography, but in the program, but that's a very funny error because instead of CNRS, it's written ENRS. And together with Attila, we are very pleased to be part of the editorial board of ENRS, which is European Network for Remembrance and Solidarity. So we are actually not uh, leaving the field of, uh, you know, identity, memory, um, sites of memory and memory uh, uh, conflicts, myths, and, and all this uh, um, wonderful stuff we are talking about uh, today. So, um, Jody uh, came, said she will talk about the past, uh, and she did, but my past is even more uh, uh, faster than, than yours. So uh, what I would like to, to pick up, I would like to pick up some ideas. I will not make a traditional, you know, uh, communication. I have no PowerPoint, I have no text, I have nothing. So I will just pick up some of the ideas that were um, uh, mentioned uh, today in the, various, uh, in the various panels and see how it applies to, uh, to the Habsburg monarchy, of course, because I am uh, speaking of what I know best, uh, which is uh, Habsburg monarchy, so broad uh, spectrum of the end of the 18th uh, century to, uh, to the First World War. And uh, actually we were asked about um, um, uh, to, to speak about uh, historical, cultural perspectives uh, in this frame. And uh, what I would like to, to, to say is that um, looking at the, at the Habsburg Empire, um, as you know, these uh, imperial uh, topics are very uh, uh, fashionable uh, today, and some people uh, seem to rediscover uh, not only the Habsburg Empire, but the empires uh, in general. I, I would like to say that for historians, the, the empires were never... Uh, well, they were dead somehow, but they were never absent from our um, uh, perspectives and from, from our uh, thinking when we think of uh, history. Uh, the, the, the perspective uh, that was um, given to us, so times of empire and towards the, the world wars, uh, is exactly what we could uh, see in the 19th century was how did in my case, the Habsburg Empire, tried to um, deal with this diversity we were talking about. Uh, it, it dealt with the diversity, trying to uh, 
uh, invent some uh, uh, traditions, of course, uh, and trying to solve inner and outer conflicts. And uh, just before us, uh, we, we were speaking of the fact that the European Union uh, is not able to deal with crisis because it doesn't create the crisis uh, itself. But what the Habsburg Empire tried to do with the nationalities uh, problems uh, was to avoid both types of conflict inner conflict, so to avoid that uh, people inside of, a, of the Habsburg Empire uh, go punching noses, but also to avoid that irredentist uh, ideas threaten the existence of the empire. And that was this permanent, you know, shifting between the two types of problems. And um, the nationalities that were favored, it's not uh, a very proper way to, 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 uh, to, to speak of this word, to, to, to mention this word, but where the, the nationalities that were supposedly not posing this kind of problem. So the nationalities that had not, had no irredentist uh, project. So, and in doing that, the empire was constantly um, you know, balancing between between the two types uh, of problems, and one of the myths we are dealing with when we uh, work uh, on the Habsburg Empire, and I'm sorry that uh, Vedran had to leave because it was very much about myth uh, uh, in his talk, uh, was the myth of federalism. Uh, this idea. Uh, came about in the in the 30s of the of the 19th century uh, with many many projects among which the one of Vasselini uh, Miklos so it started in Hungary um, but uh, towards the end of the 19th century with the growing uh, national crisis but also social and, and I don't want to go into the details uh, as you know uh, many um, politicians, uh, intellectuals, uh, even uh, uh, journalists, literary people, and so on, um, tried to promote this federalistic solution as a way out of the crisis, of the national but also international uh, crisis that was uh, surrounding uh, the Habsburg Empire. And since these um, solutions couldn't come into being, as we all know, uh, the ex post uh, analysis of the end of the Habsburg Empire and, of course, of what followed afterwards, uh, in, in order to, to paraphrase a, a, a Hungarian uh, thinker, um, were analyzed in this, uh, in this frame, which meant that if well, you know, this kind of was wäre wenn, uh, if the empire had been federalized, it would have solved everything. No First World War, no Sarajevo, no First World War, and of course, no nothing. You, you know, no Hitler, no communism, nothing. So the paradise in itself. Um, as we all know, this is absolutely, uh, well, kind of illusion. Illusion that we can understand. We can also, of course, criticized that it was it was an illusion but this is an illusion born out of what had followed of course looking in the in the 60s 70s 80s uh, here in the uh, uh, um, communist part of uh, of Europe of course the Habsburg Empire seemed as a paradise before the, total, the totalitarian uh, regimes and so on. And this gave birth to this well-known uh, nostalgia of the empire, uh, which produced uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, absolutely uh, impossible uh, type of writings that are still influential in the minds of uh, people that want to see the good the, the nice part of the story and not, of course, the conflict, the crisis and uh, the difficulties that the empire ha had uh, to solve. And as you know, probably, there is also one um, tendency of seeing the European Union, uh, well, of seeing the Habsburg Empire as somehow a, a, a pre-European Union, you know, a, a first attempt at 
uh, European uh, Union because uh, actually the Habsburg Empire had a few patterns, a few uh, features that the European Union uh, doesn't have yet, like an army, for example. Um, so, and a, a, and a very diverse army. In, in, in my various works on the Habsburg Empire, I also dealt with the army, and uh, one of our uh, unfortunately uh, deceased uh, Hungarian colleague uh, Dea Kistvan uh, worked in extensively on the diversity uh, and unity of the army. And you know, uh, as you know, when the First World War erupted, uh, even some Austrian military uh, officials said, oh, we will not stand it, the, the army is, is speaking uh, 11 languages and it, it, will, it will break up because some people will, uh, of course, uh, want to, to, uh, to, to, the, to, to, to go away from their regiments and so on. And it didn't happen, which is a fact <laughs> that uh, surprised even inside of the military uh, administration. So that, that made a part, uh, an army, uh, uh, common currency, uh, and so on and so on. So what was, what prevented actually the Habsburg Empire to become a real federation was of course not only the national uh, difficulties, but uh, also, as we uh, mentioned already this, uh, today, some of these uh, intricate, uh, as you know, populations, you couldn't cross, you couldn't draw borders between Slovenes and Italians, between Ukrainians and Poles and, and so on and so on. So federation was supposed to be inside of a, of, of a, of a, of a territory. So you would have a, a federalist uh, Moravia or Bohemia, but inside of this federation you would have had to deal with the German Czech. Uh, uh, balance between between populations. So that that's one of the problems that had to be solved if the federation would have been taken for granted, and if Francis Joseph would have uh, uh, admitted it. And that's another another problem. But it's not the subject of the of my talk. And well. I think I will I shall limit myself because I have to take a train uh, later this afternoon. So if I myself uh, exaggerate with the uh, with the length of my, my talk, it will not be uh, nice. Um, so what can we learn from this uh, um, comparison eventually between uh, between uh, Habsburg Empire and uh, today's uh, Europe? Would be certainly to deal more with this kind of, you know, mixed population, uh, uh, um, border, border crossing, and we are here just in a very uh, uh, exemplary uh, situation, because we are in a, a former imperial uh, territory, also na Hungarian national territory, so belonging both to the imperial frame and to and to Hungary and to the Kingdom uh, of Hungary, and there was a very interesting. Uh, mm, uh, I will I will finish with two 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 elements. Uh, one is um, something that you probably know of, uh, which are the uh, phantom borders. You know, phantom grenzen. Uh, I refer to the work of uh, Beatrice uh, von von Hirschhausen and other, uh, which show that. Uh, more than one century after the end of the Habsburg Empire, some of its borders are still in the mines. And we were talking about uh, Yugoslav uh, culture, you know, uniting uh, former Yugoslavia until, until today, uh, like people going to the, to the burial of, uh, of a, a popular uh, singer. So even when you draw borders, and even when you draw borders with blood, you cannot really erase the border, uh, the, uh, the, the Grenzen in Kopf, the borders people have in their in the minds, in, in, in the mentality. So that's, that's one, one of the elements I want to um, uh, give for, for uh, um, reflection in this, uh, in this uh, uh, panel, and I hope it will uh, stimulate uh, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just before I give the floor to Ahmed, just uh, two remarks. Uh, Catherine mentioned uh, 
our great uh, recently deceased uh, colleague Istvan Dejak, and the book he re she referred to has the title Beyond Nationalism. Beyond Nationalism, and according to his argumentation, the major element that was trying to keep the whole monarchy together was this officer corp. And uh, in his very uh, uh, ironic style, at a point uh, Istvan Dejak mentions that if uh, Franz Joseph had been a more modern thinker and had been trying to give more space to national aspiration in the spirit of the time, the monarchy would have survived for a much shorter time. Uh, so the being a very conservative politician was a great advantage for the, for the survival of uh, the monarchy. And I think Cassie also mentioned that uh, the monarch wanted to avoid, uh, even I could hit, want to hide conflicts. And sometimes hiding conflicts helped for a while, helped for a while. The other very short remark, I think it was 13 years ago, that Hungary was first, he had the first EU presidency. At that time, our Institute of History was given the task to prepare a longer paper to compare the functioning of the Habsburg monarchy to the functioning of the European Union. So it is not only a, a historian's uh, imagination uh, try to compare, but there was also a very practical approach to this problem, what the EU could learn and what we as Hungarians could recommend as our during our presidency for further utilization. Okay. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Achada. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in, in Kursk. I haven't been here um, since, I guess, the pandemic. Um, and um, it is uh, really wonderful to take part in the summer session again. Um, I um, am going to go a little bit further back in, in history. <laughs> Um, because I read the question or the thematic of this uh, session as uh, possible clues uh, for uh, pursuing uh, lessons from history to address today's uh, challenges in, in Europe. Um, there are many clues, um, but one has to read them co uh, uh, correctly. Um, so I, I uh, let me uh, mention three um, uh, important aspects of uh, European history that are uh, of particular interest to me. Um, one is empire, um, the the original one, um, and and the the experience that is the um, holy. Roman Empire of the German nation, which is neither holy nor German, uh, uh, nor quite Roman. <laughs> but uh, uh, that, that experience uh, ha has made an indelible mark on the collective outlook of European societies. Uh, I mean that as a, uh, not as a matter of consciousness, uh, nor as a matter of collective memory. But the length of that uh, empire uh, over a millennium uh, has uh, injected something in the European DNA, uh, basically. And that's what I mean by outlook. Um, <coughs> and that experience, uh, I think, is one that was unique in many ways in the political history of the world. Um, <coughs> And uh, it, uh, it brought with it a, a deeply rooted way of relating uh, individuals to other individuals. I mean the uh, dyadic relationships that uh, were the fundamental basis of uh, the early Middle Ages um, and how the individuals then related to their social environment as a whole and uh, mm -hmm. then uh, developing uh, uh, an understanding of rights and obligations of uh, one individual to another, um, and the important thing is belonging to the same or higher status. Uh, uh, this experience, uh, as I mentioned, is, is unique 
because uh, of another reason, and that is that this process of development took place in the absence of a state. Uh, in, other, in other words, without the presence of a, a state as the adjudicator of conflicts or disputes. So in, in individuals, uh, by multiple pacts, had to uh, basically uh, defend themselves, uh, make sure that uh, this notion of multiple pacts uh, was the secular and individualistic basis from which the empire, then uh, the society under the empire built itself. So the key processes that took place in the empire was the gradual development uh, of, of the modern state. And by that, I mean the gradual development of the modern state uh, driven by uh, economic uh, necessity and economic needs. Um, there, um, of course, Tilly, uh, who has uh, a large following, uh, is arguing something else with which um, I respectfully disagree in terms of uh, the uh, early Middle Ages and the, uh, and the development of the consolidation, very slow consolidation of what we call the modern state at a, at a much later stage uh, by demand from uh, society. Uh, how did this happen? One was the uh, preferences of the emerging trading classes, the early uh, traders uh, were the fundamental beginnings of, of uh, bourgeois uh, to pay taxes to the strongest among the regional nobles so as to ensure law and order. Uh, why would they pay taxes to the weaker ones? Uh, which were unable to uh, uh, protect the uh, safety of trading routes. Uh, second, uh, the economic burdens of administering, protecting, or making living out of smaller uh, fiefs, uh, that led to uh, processes of commendatio, basically not being able to uh, administer that, so you give your estate to a more powerful lord and you accept the protection in terms of uh, some duties and obligations. Or in some, uh, sometimes the reverse order uh, proce process of beneficium. Um, and then uh, again, uh, very much of administrative economic necessities. Um, the, the third one a little later, but uh, certainly the, uh, the uh, rise of um, national identity in France, and I mean the earlier, uh, much earlier one, going to the Philip the Good, um, where uh, the, uh, why should they pay taxes uh, to the Pope? Uh, and, and all the clergy in France basically agreed that they should, uh, the taxes they pay should be to the French king. Uh, these were all uh, economically driven. That is not usually how uh, this empire is taught or the medieval period is taught, so that's... So uh, the, this legal and political culture of empire was shaped by the emerging of Roman law and, and uh, German custom, as we all know, but the dynamics of the dialectical relationship between these two uh, is, is uh, uh, crucially important. In this regard, the empire transmitted uh, through more than a millennium, over a period of more than a millennium, a suggestion of a secular outlook, actually. The empire connected Cicero with later legal systems by the notion of natural law. Um, the, notion, the, the notion of natural uh, law uh, by that notion, the empire gave the thinking person of the medieval period uh, the means to uphold reason or revelation because, re because natural law was described as something that you could reach and comprehend by the power of your reasoning. Um, well, uh, and, and uh, this is 
this is a very early uh, period uh, uh, connecting the, the notion of uh, uh, natural law that comes out of the uh, pre-Christian Roman tradition uh, to uh, uphold this, uh, basically uh, uh, to uphold reason over revelation, uh, something I might add that uh, Trump appointed U.S. Supreme Court justices failed to see today. Um, third, um, uh, the empire witnessed a fundamental paradigm changes in the European economy from agriculture to trade to the monetization of economy to the rise of middle classes, the impoverishment of lesser feudal elements, ultimately leading to an accommodation between the bourgeoisie and the more powerful rulers such as uh, kings. The overall aim was to reduce transaction costs in order to increase benefits according to uh, accruing to uh, smaller political units in a fragmented empire. It resulted in the lowering of taxes, so it is an antecedent to uh, the Single Market Act of 1985. Um, my second uh, uh, point uh, is uh, the Westphalian order. Now, the Westphalian order is a turning point in the history of uh, nations because um, it uh, basically uh, it recognized the state as uh, the sovereign uh, unit. Um, it was the Peace of Westphalia did not call for specific arrangements or alliances uh, or seek a permanent uh, European political structure. But it lasted long enough to uh, provide some means. But the important thing about the Westphalian order was uh, essentially it introduced two things. One is that um, the ending of wars from time immemorial until then was basically either winner take all or winner take most. This was a matter of multilateral accommodation. It introduced that, which again uh, is a, uh, as, as, uh, some uh, aspect of being antecedent to multilateralism that uh, 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 that that uh, we see in uh, the European uh, structure. Um, it, uh, it also introduced uh, realism, and it, as I said, uh, introduced uh, accommodation. Um, the, the notion of accommodation uh, here is that uh, the, it did not particularly uh, support uh, power, but made power uh, subject to accommodation of uh, the uh, European group of uh, states. Uh, if a, a, a major country threat, threatened to uh, have hegemony over others, it prevented that. But also if a state uh, sought to enter the ranks of major powers, it also accommodated that. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it prevented uh, the uh, overall um, uh, desire of hegemony by uh, Louis XIV. Uh, at the same time, it allowed uh, the uh, Frederick the Great to have equal status as a, a power. But it didn't last. It didn't last uh, because of a number of reasons, but um, it, it fragmented Europe 
uh, it was, again, like dealing with the dyadic set of uh, uh, relationships, it is too much given the number of uh, fra uh, a number of principalities and states in, in a fragmented Germany. So essentially, uh, it, it, there was a turn uh, to uh, the de uh, turn to um, uh, to uh, in, in the Vienna Congress to um, have a stability in terms of um, a, uh, balance of power. Um, and that balance of power uh, brought something, but uh, the circumstances of, of that was basically two things. One is, of course, the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon. And uh, Napoleon had to be contained. But Napoleon not only uh, was a uh, hegemonic threat to the balance in, in, in Europe, but an, an often forgotten part is that Napoleon basically uh, turned the uh, hierarchical order of society under the empire on its head. I mean, the, 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 the best example of that is uh, basically uh, Stendhal's Red on the Black. Uh, you have, <laughs> you, you have uh, Julien Sorel there dreaming of uh, becoming an important person and the only way he can become an important person is via an army. He's there, uh, good for nothing, sitting on a tree and in, in, in the, in the uh, out, uh, 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 where, where was it? Uh, Besançon? Besançon? Yes. yes, yeah, yes. yes it, it was, uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, he's dreaming of that because uh, the, uh, the army uh, would offer uh, a uh, social mobility upwards, whereas the, uh, the estate system on which uh, the empire and, and Western Europe uh, basically was, uh, was built would not uh, accommodate that. Um, uh, secondly, of course, uh, the, the other aspect was that uh, there should be no threat uh, 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 from, uh, from Russia. Russia entered uh, as a threat uh, when Napoleon uh, was uh, defeated after, uh, in, 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 uh, in Moscow. Uh, because of winter, basically, and uh, uh, they well, uh, the Russian soldiers uh, were seen in in the suburbs of Paris, and that was absolutely a frightening case. So, um, <coughs> so the uh, the the uh, the geopolitics of the uh, of 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 Europe. And what is internal and what is external are uh, very uh, clearly illustrated in uh, these uh, examples. I think I have um, better uh, 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 summarize and finish uh, this uh, intervention. Uh, so uh, there is no conclusion that I can give. I can. There is no, uh, because this is an open case. There is no conclusion. But as as a way of ending my intervention, <laughs> let me underscore three of the clues that are implicitly a part of this intervention. One is that, of course, the European history has a rich variety of clues to follow with a view to drawing relevant lessons for addressing today's challenges. And um, I, I just gave a couple of examples, more than a couple. But one has to take historical circumstances in their own context and not read into history metaphors of today's challenges. Uh, instead, assess new proposals based on historical antecedents in terms of their utility in terms of whether they are just, and in terms of whether they promise stability and predictability. In both of these cases, the um, Westphalian case and the Congress of Vienna, 
the, the long discussions there, uh, looked at these three, um, uh, basically, uh, measurements. Number two is that crises, external or internal, to uh, every crisis is different in its own way, to take Tolstoy's uh, dictum in Anna Karenina. Westphalian system brought a substantial European solution to internal problems and opened a new era in international relations. It did not, however, rise to external challenges, as I tried to explain very briefly, which the Congress of Vienna did until some of the major parties destroyed the balance of power because of their own interests later. And finally, the most important is the confidence in the system's ability to face and overcome challenges. This is what has to be done today. Uh, without leadership and without confidence, it is difficult to imagine any lesson to be drawn profitably from your Europe and implemented as an effective means for rising to the present challenges facing us all. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, just a very small remark before I give the floor uh, to Gabor. Uh, uh, Ahmed argued that we shouldn't be misled by metaphors and myths. Uh, uh, this is a, a good teaching, but unfortunately this can hardly be implemented because this is the much easier to understand myths and metaphors are much easier to understand than the complexity of given situation. And the other issue that is, of course, uh, it's very interesting to look at the empires, the Westphalian situation, but uh, it is also extremely remarkable how the internal structure of the agent uh, changed. Imagine if uh, the leaders of the empires has had to undergo elections every four years, uh, and if Metternich had had to lead uh, campaigns uh, for re-elections uh, every three years or four years. So the confidence was uh, in a certain uh, 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 sympathy or, or empathy with uh, ma other members of a similar social layer, and the democratization and overall democratization, so social historical development, also had an uh, impact on international relations because the agents, if you look at the agents who are shaping international politics in the aftermath of the First World War or during the First World War, this does undergo substantial changes. And uh, this is, of course, we have to examine, carefully examine, of course, this historical example, but the other uh, social uh, and uh, ideological transformations that are taking place have also an impact on international relations and the way agents function. Uh, Catherine referred to uh, Jula Sekfu, and uh, he, for example, uh, one of his uh, first summaries of Hungarian history had the title, A Biography of the Hungarian State. So it's not the society, it's not the nation, according to his interpretation, it is the state that is the major agent. But as we move on, we can more and more see that it's not only the, the state that can be a very important agent, but various uh, movements in the restructuring of societies contribute to agency and have an just if you think of the emergence of fascism and communism and its impact on international relations, uh, that shows how the two are intertwined. Now, may I give now the floor to uh, Gabor? Thank you very much. I do not want to waste your precious time, so I'm not going to speak about database building. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> originally, I started my career as a young scholar dealing with diplomacy of the Balkan Peninsula, focusing especially on the Balkan Wars in 1912-13. Then I moved to studying the diplomacy of Austria-Hungary, and now I'm, I'm trying to draw some parallels between 19th century uh, diplomatic efforts and the present situation. 
Uh, recent political events in the Balkans have shown again that the peninsula is one of the most vulnerable peripheries along the boundaries of the EU. The peninsula is unstable. The Balkans are still a power keg, powder keg. Uh, the Northern Macedonian, Bulgarian, Northern Macedonian Greek conflict, the Serb Kosovo conflict, the weakness of federal Bosnia, whose fate is observed with fear by the elite in North Macedonia, Dodik's activity, the quarrel over the lithium mines in Serbia, compounded by the growing influence of Russia, China, and Turkey in the region, and the global problem of migration all point to the need to read again the history books. However, we cannot speak about the history of the Balkans. Uh, we just may speak about opposing, competing national histories, trying to expropriate the past, um, building their future on them. The same event is rarely evaluated in the same manner by Balkan countries, as each has its own narrative and interpretation. Supranational approaches is, is very rare. Excuse me, would you please hold the microphone like this? <laughs> no, not this, this. OK. OK. It is no coincidence that the Österreichische Institut for Internationale Politik has twice addressed the problems of the region within two months. First in March, in a roundtable discussion dealing with the election year and the expectation for the EU integration. And then in May, in the context of the Srebrenica genocide, when the international geopolitical situation in the region was examined from historical perspective as well. Historians, first Florian Bieber and Philip Ter, then Vedran Jihic and Muhammad Bechirovic, publishing a book on Metternich, investigated the Eastern question revisited, what can we learn from 19th century power politics in Europe for today? As an attendee, I was stunned by the answer. There is much to learn, but nothing uh, we have actually learned <laughs> that could be used as a medicine for the region. <laughs> Stunned, but also inspired to think further uh, in this lecture by comparing present problems with historical problems and drawing parallels, I tried to highlight some common inherent features of the region. The weakness of democracy, the tradition of violence, permanent ge geopolitical conditions, and so on. When doing this, I also tried to highlight some methods of the past to mitigate tensions. The Viennese Roundtable suggests the EU seems to be more hesitant and indecisive than China, Russia, or Turkey, which try to exploit the fragmented and entangled structure, which is an inherent uh, um, legacy of the peninsula, to secure its influence. One reason for this poor Viennese conclusion, I think, is that historians should be always cautious when using analogies. Uh, though events seem to repeat themselves, external circumstances might change. Despite the striking similarities in the basic geopolitical situation, to sum it up shortly, penetration of powers in a buffer zone, which is the Balkans, the recurrence of violence, uh, there are also significant differences between the 19th and 21st century. The region is now not only a buffer zone, but it is also situated in a power vacuum. The conceptual difference may, be, may seem very subtle, but the fact is that before 1914, the political situation was different. The European powers were active players, but in most cases, their very active presence in the Balkans was aimed at maintaining the balance of power between them. On the other hand, before 1914, there was a regional middle power that was geopolitically capable of preventing Russian penetration, that was Austria-Hungary. Today, the emergence of new players in the region, like China, is a definite sign of existing power vacuum. Now, neither of the men above mentioned two circumstances do exist. The power system is not based on balancing between European powers of near equal status anymore, neither it is bipolar. And the regional middle power, Austria-Hungary, has failed after fulfilling its geopolitical function of blocking Russian and Ottoman influence, uh, at least based on the theory of challenge response as applied in geopolitics. For this reason, any historical analogy should be treated with reservations, but on the level of intervention techniques and tactics, they can be used. For this reason, I will discuss intervention possibilities a bit later. I would also stress that the EU do not have a uniform and concise crisis management, not only because of the lack of military capacities, contrary to the collective actions in the Balkans in the 18th century, which of course also served to prevent the rival European power from gaining strength, uh, and these also had humanitarian character. 
The fact that Russian aggression in Ukraine diverts attention from the peninsula also contributes to the abandonment of proactive and preventive policies of the EU here. The peninsula, with its unresolved problems, became a secondary theater despite its great vulnerability to destabilization. The process of EU accession decelerated, uh, and EU, in now, EU now pursues a reactive policy instead of a proactive one in the region, while the autonomous actions of some member states like Bulgaria or Hungary on certain issues, for example in the case of Macedonia, became stronger and stronger. The early 1990s was also a good example of this reactive policy. The unification kept Germany preoccupied, so the humanitarian risks of Yugoslavia's breakup were not given sufficient attention. For example, Catherine Burke's book on the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, which can be considered as an analogy, a precursor of the conflicts of 1990s, was not published until 1994, while the US had republished the Carnegie Commission's famous volume on the causes of the Balkan Wars already in 1990 with a foreword written by George F. Cannon. The difference in the attitude is noticeable. Both American diplomacy and historiography reacted more quickly than Europeans. The situation gives local governments much greater room for maneuvering, aided by the presence of Chinese or Russian capital. Uh, these two countries do not impose such strict political conditions on local government to implement democratic changes as demanded by the EU. In other words, uh, the loans offered by China or Russia do not threaten the uh, power of local politicians in the short term. It is no use of the EU giving six billion if the local population values stability over democratization. In the region, where all generations have been traumatized by war, unlike in the West or in East Central Europe, where in a region where the violence is part of tradition and history, this choice is not surprising at all. Rather, it is interesting to see why the promise of political stability and predictability is linked to better living condition in the judgment of local population, instead of living, uh, linking the notion of democracy with the concept of welfare. However, the geopolitical importance of the peninsula has remained stable uh, even among changing foreign political constellation, mm, which is why I chose geopolitical approach as a basis of comparison and analogies. Because of its natural geographic determinants, the fragmented and dissected nature of the peninsula, the significance of main routes remained fairly stable. Uh, just take a closer look on the top left uh, picture on the slide, you can see the Budapest-Belgrade uh, railroad, which is very important from geopolitical reasons, and the blue line also indicates the 19th century importance of the Vienna, Budapest, Saloniki, uh, Drangnach, Salonika uh, road, the Varvar Morava axis. The Balkans were the gateway to Europe during the Ottoman Empire and are now the gateway to China. The Belgrade Bud Budapest Railway is, is to China what the Belgrade Saloniki Railway was to the monarchy, or the Belgrade Constantinople Railway meant to be for Germany before the First World War. When China expands in Montenegro, it is the Russian Danube Adriatic Railway project of the early uh, 20th century to counterweight the Austrian Sanjak Railway, inevitably comes to the mind of a historian. When China wants to acquire Europe's largest lithium deposits in Serbia, the ores of Bohr and Maidan pack used in aircraft in the interval period came to mind, or the Hungarian-Austrian rivalry over the Bosnian iron ore in Priedor. The main route of international gas pipelines coincide with the old railway lines as well. So this is the geographical determination what I'm talking about. The existence and the present poor situation of North Macedonia is the product of the rivalry between the weak nationalism of the neighboring countries in the 19th century, uh, which were unable to beat the other. And this brings us from geopo geographical space to political space. North Macedonia is a buffer state located at the overlap of Greek, Serbian, and Bulgarian dreams in the past. The political geography of the peninsula is as fragmented as its natural geography, but it is partly the fault of the great powers, which saw the promotion of many nationalism, instead of one, as a way of gaining influence and countering rivals. Brubaker has pointed out that nationalism is still virulent in the region today, stronger than supranationalist attitudes. This, of course, makes the EU as a, 
as an institution very suspicious in the region. Serbia is orienting itself toward the BRICS. Just think of Williams placing flowers on Stalin's grave. It can be hardly interpreted as a pro-EU movement. Um, the great powers of the 19th century, though they were empires, uh, have historically been good at fanning the flames of nationalism and chauvinism, not just at carving up the region into splinter states. For Austria-Hungary, Yugoslavism or Greater Bulgaria was threatening with Russian overpower. The Albanian national idea, which unites three religions on the basis of a common language, was an invention of Austria-Hungary indeed, based on the Hungarian national idea. In Bosnia, Benjamin Kallai attempted to do the same by creating a regional identity on territorial basis, uniting Slavs of different religion. Although this first attempt, which preceded the Albanian experiment, failed, the modern Bosniak nation was born torn from the Ottoman millet. It is not surprising that Kala is still considered the most damaging and dangerous politician by the Serbs, since he turned Serbia's attention to southward, diverting its attention from Bosnia to Kosovo. And the fact that Kosovo became so important for the Serbs, generating numerous conflicts in the, presence, in the present, uh, is as much the responsibility of Hungarian historians as of Serbs. And what do we see now? The Hungarian Balkan policy is undoubtedly active, even showing some old imperial attitudes as legacies, but it does not lead to the normalization of the processes in the region, uh, despite the peacekeeping role of Hungarian soldiers in Kosovo and Bosnia. In 2023, I had the opportunity to participate in the training of the Hungarian EU4 forces going to Bosnia, led by General Stitz. Uh, where the soldiers themselves admitted that their situation is quite obscure and difficult because of the hesitant behavior of Western politicians, uh, the different attitude of the Hungarian politicians. Although Republika Srpska with, uh, with a population of only 700,000 is economically and demographically weak. Uh, however, Putin and Vucic behind Dodik cause more problems. I told them that an immediate beginning of the EU accession talks might help, but uh, the, as the present situation shows, Dodik still finds a way to block integration. The nationalism in the region is a dangerous weapon, whether stored by neighbors, former powers, or exploited by local politicians. Just look at the townscape of Skopje. Uh, in a mutual expropriation of history, Bulgaria is threatening to veto North Macedonia's accession if the, to the EU if it does not recognize the Macedonian nation's Bulgarian roots. In the middle, you can see uh, Tsar Samuel, the Bulgarian one. In the bottom right corner, you can see Tsar Samuel, the Macedonian ruler. Uh, the first located uh, in the main square of Sofia, the second one in Skopje. What is much more interesting, uh, observe the crown on Samuel's head. Uh, uh, there was a small diplomatic quarrel because it is the Hungarian holy crown <laughs> <laughs> located on Tsar Samuel. So this is the expropriation and entanglement which can be a clue, a common feature behind, uh, beyond violence, uh, for example. Um, the Bulgarians argued that in 1878 the Turnover Constitution was voted by the Macedonian delegates during the National Constitutional Assembly, clearly, clearly declaring the belongings, uh, which was that time manifested also in joining the Bulgarian Exarchate, independent of the Patriarchate. So they have a, a legal argument why Macedonians claimed themselves Bulgarians in a certain moment of history. Uh, in the Negotiating Historians Committee, non-nationalist members uh, such as Chavdar Marinov and Grigor Boykov were soon expelled and replaced by <laughs> nationalists. Um, Macedonia has not had a census for almost 30 years. The state is characterized by duplicated parallel structures, 20 ministries. In Bosnia there are even more, uh, which are expensive and do not have the integration of parallel societies. Macedonian politicians, seeing their country's predecessor and the destiny in Bosnia, react vividly to every stirring uh, uh, in Dayton, Bosnia. This was particularly notable in 20. Uh, 21 uh, during the, uh, the political quarrel over the Yansha letter. Nationalism is still evident in the selection of official national symbols as well. Uh, this is violence as a key moment of Greeks, uh, Bulgarians and Ottomans as well. 
Ah, yes, this is. Nationalism is still evident in the selection of official national symbols. We generate debates. The, the four uh, C in the Serbian coat of arms are a clear reference, even if there's an alternate reading. C, uh, bottom right. Uh, part of the picture. The message of the Montenegrin coat of arms and national anthem is clearly an anti-Serbian message, an anti-Yugoslavian message, as it dates back prior to 1918. The original flag and even the name of Macedonia had to be changed because of uh, Greek discontent. Chauvinism helped externalizing internal tensions, channeling violence. It is, worth also, it is also worth mentioning that conflicts in the Balkans are not all ethnic conflicts, but many of them are ethnicized. That is, conflicts of interest arising from personal, economic, and cultural differences, which are manifested along this dimension of ethnicity. It's very easy to ethnicize uh, conflicts. Among the external factors fomenting chauvinism is Russia, which finances almost all right-wing parties in the region. A peculiarity of the democratic deficit in the Balkans is that the ultra-democratic constitutions of the 19th century were quickly eroded and devaluated by the unconscious masses of voters. Another specific feature of early Balkan democracies was that uh, political parties in Greece or in Bulgaria were in fact formed not so much along I ideological lines, but uh, at least as much along foreign political lines. Moreover, these democratic constitutions haven't been able to get rid of clientelism or populism. The Bulgarian constitution was used by the Russians to test whether the power of the elite, pro-Russian elite of course, could be maintained, overtly stating that Bulgaria is going to be uh, the Finland of the South. Um, and how the uneducated masses of people would behave under these circumstances before constitution is introduced in Russia. Uh, the negative experience in 1886 convinced the Russian elite that it was not worth ex experimenting at home and the mass democracy was devaluated in the Balkans. Uh, in the past, it was also possible to check uh, Balkan nationalism or, or encourage Balkan nationalism with financial purposes. Now we can see similar patterns. Um, total bankruptcy, of course, was against the interests of creditors, so neither the Ottoman Empire nor Greece, which went bankrupt as early as in 19, uh, 1897, failed, but their sovereignty was severely eroded by, the, by placing their finances under international supervision. Control of the budgets could also influence their foreign policy. Today, Chinese capital investments are very similar. If a country fails to meet the terms, it pays for it with a share of its sovereignty, in, meaning in territorial rights. And finally, how to move on, how to localize conflicts. Uh, the lessons we learned from uh, 19th century historical interventions. The first Option is open, but joined armed intervention. This is what happened in the Crimean War of 1853-56 uh, against Russia. Today, however, such an intervention would not localize the war because of the increase in the range and destructive power of the weapons. Moreover, the international results of this war had been virtually destroyed by 1870 with the advance of the Russian diplomacy, which exploited the French-German conflict by 1877, the Russians were once again facing Constantinople. Action by a single power, as Austria-Hungary did against the Serbs in Albania in 1913, is hardly possible in the present circumstances, since the European regional powers are mostly members of the NATO, and this also limits the possibilities for individual actions, and any intervention by non-European powers is, I guess, not, a considered, not considered desirable by EU politicians. Joint action of powers in alliance, like in uh, 1913 in Scutari, for example, may help, as well as the NATO presence in Kosovo might uh, deter offense. Uh, but there are cases when demonstration of force is not enough, and the application of raw force, like the NATO bombing in Serbia, has only a temporary result, but it did not resolve the conflict on the long run. After the failure of open intervention, the powers defeated the Russians and Bulgarian and Serbian dreams at the negotiating table in uh, 1878 in Berlin. However, Bulgaria had violated the treaty seven years later, to which the Russians responded with another violation of this treaty as well when they removed Alexander Battenberg from the Bulgarian throne, while the Sultan was the sovereign itself. 
And this precedent, of course, was followed by Austria-Hungary, also violating the treaty when siding with the Bulgarians under Hungarian pressure, uh, and then broke the Berlin Treaty again in 1908 uh, with the annexation of Bosnia. So uh, it means that, in other words, negotiations do not necessarily lead to permanent stabilization. The third option was to take the monopoly of violence away from the rival parties and intervene to, intervene to restore peace in a form of humanitarian intervention, usually on the side of Christians. Um, this is violence, national trauma is a key feature of the history of the Balkans. And it is usually the Christians that are victimized, uh, even from the aspect of powers. Um, so, humanitarian intervention uh, was the key to success, and um, which now is missing. Lebanon around 1860, Crete at the end of the 19th century, Eastern Rum Rumelia after 1878, then Macedonia after the Murstag Agreement, uh, can be seen as peacekeeping missions, humanitarian interventions to halt the raging violence instead of the sovereign that lose control. This is not always a success story either. Eastern Rumelia and Crete were eventually lost to the Ottoman Empire, but at least there was no more bloodshed. In Macedonia, however, the presence of power did not bring stability, and today's Lebanon is not stable either. Uh, the international gendarmerie in Albania had a similar function, but it could not save Wilhelm V. Thron in or Albania from civil war in 1914. And the last thought. However, in the case of Eastern Romania, Crete and Macedonia, apart from, apart from peacekeeping, there were also attempts to change the social and economic structures, and these can be considered progressive. Reforms of jurisdiction, tax collection, turning irregular paramilitary troops into regular ones, reorganization of administration, establishment of parallel international and Ottoman military and civil administrative systems, at the time, the local population expected, for example, the cantonization of Macedonia. What we see today, this solution is apparently not sufficient solution in Bosnia, for example. And the government in today's Macedonia did not even attempt a cantonization. The lesson, that is, that the lesson is that military presence alone, without commu uh, communicating and establishing uh, civil presence, cannot stabilize the situation, especially if the intervention of the armed forces is very limited. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So we saw an extremely great, we listened to an extremely great number of parallels, but uh, I think the conclusion drawn were quite skeptical. So this is something that we might consider, but these are the advantages, these are the disadvantages. Uh, before I open the floor for discussions, uh, I should like to ask the participants of Peter to react uh, to each other but in a peculiar way. I think some of you or most of you know the House of European History in Brussels, and it has a permanent exhibition and it has a space some um, temporary exhibitions. Now, based on your studies, uh, under the present circumstances, if you were invited as an expert, uh, like uh, Gabor was invited as an expert to prepare the Hungarian soldier for the Bosnian intervention, if you were invited as an expert uh, to recommend what kind of a temporary exhibition today that uh, would teach a lesson to whoever is going there and hundreds of thousands of people going there all the time, uh, what would you recommend on the, so summarizing your, uh, your the, the recommendations you have and reacting to each other? Could you improvise something? Uh, well, yes. Um, actually, it's uh, for me it's quite easy to, to answer your question because I would, of course, uh, insist, well, I, I visited the, 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 the museum, of course, and I know one of the, the curator uh, Christine Dupont. So um, uh, I would I would insist, of course, on this uh, mixity. I mean, diversity of population, uh, not only in border areas, as I mentioned, but still this is extremely important. Um, but also on this uh, uh, former, not on not 
only former but uh, coexistence of uh, nationalities, uh, confessions, uh, denominations in in some of uh, uh, parts in some parts of Europe. And I don't think only of our region here. I also can mention I don't know Spain or uh, or you know or or recently the uh, recently well some 10 20 years ago so the, the rediscovery in Italy of the uh, uh, border area of uh, you know Trentino and and all this which were Western, actually, but we, you had this uh, opposition Western-Eastern. It was also mentioned uh, uh, earlier the, uh, this afternoon. So maybe something more on, um, on this uh, mixity uh, topic with, with real examples and maybe this transurban uh, histories, uh, Elsass, you know, all these all this regions that bri uh, bridge the gap between uh, national narratives. It's a challenging question for me, but um, what I would uh, do, I, I would <coughs> try to uh, first get uh, some artists and art historians together, a small group, to identify a, a, a theme. Um, and my, my preference would be uh, the, br the region, mm -hmm. uh, but get a... Uh, Get a, get a theme, and then have that group uh, go and select actual uh, paintings and sculptures and put them together as an exhibition. Uh, so uh, I, I think it, it would entail uh, first a, a, a theme, and then secondly, collection of, of uh, actual produced mm -hmm. contemporary art to bring it, uh, bring it as a temporary exhibition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, as a historian, I, I had a dream to, to issue a book uh, called Picturing the Balkans, where all famous paintings that were able to influence uh, great publicity um, will be shown and analyzed, representing either violence or coexistence, cohabitation, cooperation, uh, stereotypes, prejudices. Uh, and if I'm thinking great, uh, a similar exhibition can be located in, in this region. The second challenge goes to those uh, colleagues at the Institute who have been dealing with the problems that Gabor has just challenged. So because uh, under the leadership of Jody, so we had a project about uh, uh, populism on the, on the Balkans and uh, the historical memory and Balkans. So would, uh, which element, so to say, of, of Gabor's argumentation would you share, the more pessimistic or the more optimistic one? So, well, because uh, he was trying to point out some positive avenues or negative avenues, but always concluding in a quite a skeptical way. <laughs> would you share this skepticism? So those who, or those who, who other scholars in the field? Yes, 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 yes. So whoever, whoever, whoever would like to. Actually, thank you so much uh, to all of you uh, for wonderful presentations and uh, thank you Gabor for, for your presentation. I found it really challenging to follow, even though I'm from the Balkans and I don't know how others cope. It is really packed with information. Very interesting indeed. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is, um, um, I, I see the pessimism there and uh, it, it instantly struck me as how convoluted, complex the history or the histories of the Balkans are. So uh, because I was thinking about uh, reconciliation and, and previously in some previous panels, we mentioned that reconciliation uh, in the Balkans 
uh, would be the prerequisite for some kind of a brighter future, if not uh, EU integrations. So what I wanted to ask you is, do you even see uh, some kind of possibility to, to have some kind of facing the, of the past in the sense of uh, uh, finding some kind of common understanding of history. Do you even see it or not? Because this would be the, the important thing, to make, to make some kind of an agreement on what actually happened, to have some kind of... Um, <laughs> do, do you see this uh, possible? And if yes, maybe who's... Uh, explain uh, whose history would be the closest to something that that everybody would agree for. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very difficult question, I but I can come ahead oh, and okay. I want to make a question on that too. Um, yeah, the, you know, there were initiatives in '89 for Central Europe to do a joint rewriting of of, of the regional history here. It di it didn't really go anywhere. Um, the other th comment I wanted to make is that you talk about reconciliation. I think that's a that's a you know step too far. I mean, if we can get to the level of tolerance, I think that that might you know that might be helpful. There is a c common textbook written for the history of the ex Yugoslavia written for the students of high school uh, many years ago. Nobody cares. No. It exists. If you're interested, you can read it. I'm sure it's, it's not used <coughs> because people who decide usually are do those employed in ministries, usually those. But obviously, I, I, I worked in, in, in a high school in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, you would be amazed that there's still like pretty incredible teachers that do teach history in, in different way, but there is a book. I just wanted to say that. Uh, so, should we? Thank you very much for all of you for really interesting presentation and uh, reminding of a lot of. Um, facts and uh, and theories about uh, the history and what we can learn actually the echo of the history of today life actually i will start from the last speaker for the gabon just i don't know do you know that it's now the common commission between macedonia and bulgaria discussing for the historical figure like you said mentioned here Tsar samuel they, they find the the common solution about Tsar samuel even that he is armenian he is not bulgarian he's macedonian he is armenian but uh, it's important because of the question of the empire, as, uh, as mentioned it, uh, Ahmed, <laughs> uh, who, 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 ha who has the right to be the, <laughs> to heritage the empire of the Tsar Samuel. Actually, that was the question, even though he is Armenian by origin. But now they, ha they find the solution. And I don't know, do you know why he, they put the Hungarian throne? Because uh, actually the, the son of Tsar Samuel he is married with Hungarian princess, actually, Peter Delian. So for that reason, they, they just want to show the, the connection. And it's not so funny. It's, it's historical fact, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, I have some question for Catherine also. Um, about the question of, um, of um, diversity of the Austro-Hungarian or Habsburg Empire and the question of the of autonomies, of national identities, and uh, I don't know that you saw, I saw one movie actually called Sarajevo from one Austrian uh, director, Prohaska, I think, and he, the movie is called Sarajevo. It was very surprising for me about the conspiration of the assassination of the Ferdinand, actually, that behind the assassination is staying the, the military top of the Habsburg uh, em Empire. Uh, it's also related with the business, with the, with the rail lines and, and so on. So what is your opinion about that uh, uh, new approach? Uh, because um, also, I will discuss tomorrow maybe in our session for the quality of memory, is still in Bosnia Herzegovina a big question about the assassination of Ferdinand and Gavrilo Princip, he's a hero or he's not a hero, even it's a huge discussion today in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina for that reason. Uh, about uh, Ahmed also, thank you for your kind presentation. Actually, um, I think that the, the interests of the big power are, are internal, only the form is changing. Maybe in the 19th century, 
the form for uh, to find that the conflict is there were the religious rights of the people, because in the empire we are talking only for religious rights. Miller system in Ottoman Empire in austro Hungary also the other religious uh, groups. Uh, but uh, when, when appeared the idea of a nation, it then it became the, the, the issue of national minorities. And after that came the, actually the issue of, of the rights of national minorities. And today we are talking about human rights. <laughs> so when we're talking for Ukraine, for Russia, you know, for other countries and for Gaza, of course we are talking about human rights. So generally what you think about this, uh, um, even now we are talking for human rights, we, we are talking also for other, not only ethnic, religious, but also many, many identities, even even it's not uh, agree with me, but I think that different identities is, is still the power that is moving the, the society. So what is your opinion about that? And uh, for Gabor, I, I didn't see here, but the, the, the reality of the Balkan is a multicultural divide society. It's not only the question of the nation, what Judith say, it's not only the question how to describe the history of the nations. We have to describe maybe the history of diversity and human history. Maybe uh, some of you know this, um, the Havar Zinn actually, book about the people history of the United States. Also we have some examples for the Balkan in some Macedonia to write the people history because the, the people oral history is really much more different from the official national histories. Uh, thank you. So before you answer, I think uh, we should give also a chance to Chaba, who is patient, who has been patiently waiting for some time. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, a more general question uh, from uh, concerning the very inspiring talk of Catherine Orell. Uh, and uh, the, it, it, it is a question of uh, the integrative possibilities. Uh, uh, she alluded as uh, as the lesson we should learn from the Hevs Monary because, uh, because uh, I mean, she mentioned that uh, uh, imperial uh, rule or, or empires had to uh, to cope with with diversity and uh, had to uh, had to arrange uh, integration of the heterogeneous uh, uh, and it is I think at the moment for the European Union uh, a fundamental question how how could we uh, at, at least imagine or conceive of any any kind of integrative uh, a uh, forced factor uh, or 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 whatsoever. So that's 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 a general question because I think that, that the Habsburg monarchy uh, had a, a, a fundamental different uh, um, constellation. Uh, at Attila Polk uh, uh, referred to uh, to the analysis of Istvan Deak, uh, who, who identified an external factor uh, uh, of of internet integration in uh, in the officers' core. Uh, and uh, concerning uh, Ahmed Evin's very interesting uh, considerations, I would just uh, um, remark uh, uh, two things. First of all, uh, the definition of empire is, is not a well settled issue. Uh, there are at least two parties, uh, one of which say, saying that uh, the empire is something bad, it's uh, repression and exploitation, and the other party uh, saying that uh, that empires had certain organizing functions, uh, investments, and so on and so on. So it, 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 it is a complicated issue. Uh, and the second remark uh, concerns the Westphalian order. Um, there, 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 is, uh, there is an interesting application or, or continuation of, uh, of Westphalian ideas in, in the theory of new wars uh, and new military conflicts in, in, the, uh, in the conception of Mary Calder and Herfried Munkler, who, who both claim that, that it is the collapse of the Westphalian order after World War II, uh, which, uh, uh, which um, results in, in uh, the emergence of new, co new conflicts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I think we should give a chance to the Panel participants. Uh, thank you for uh, for the the, the questions. Uh, well, you mean you mean the the film of the fifties? You mean the old one? Oh, the, the, uh, the well. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, 
Boo. <laughs> okay. Uh, there were uh, quite a lot of um, works and conferences and, and collective books on, on Francis Ferdinand. On uh, He was also, of course, reinvented as a federalist, uh, which, to my opinion, he never was. This is a kind of, you know, reconstructing, and, and since he, he died, of course, it's very easy to picture him as he would have been the savior uh, of, the, of the empire. And so there is on one side uh, a glorification of his supposed uh, will to reform, to reform the empire. He certainly wanted to do something. But maybe, uh, we, well, and, and other topics. And maybe this would have been a catastrophe. I, well. This is this is we can we can speculate on that. Uh, so he was on one side uh, pictured as the possible savior of the empire, and some of the uh, works and films and books that have been uh, produced uh, since uh, 2014 go in this direction. And of course, on the other side, there is a more let's say uh, balanced uh, view of his. Uh, capacities and incapacities um, in 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 this in this uh, well field of possible reform of uh, uh, of the empire and on the other side you have also of course demonization and glorification of Gavrilo, Gavrilo Princip with the, all these new statues and well the one in Belgrade and and this this, this kind of thing. What is interesting, uh, considering the evolution of the. Uh, the image of Princip in Yugoslavia after 1918 was that he was first, of course, seen as the, the, the trigger uh, effect, bringing to, uh, uh, facilitating the birth of the first Yugoslavia. But at one moment in the 30s, his image uh, uh, was transformed because he was a regicide. And so, uh, well, he was on one side a uh, uh, Yugoslav, Serbian patriot and, and the like, but on the other side he was an assassin who killed a, a, a possible future king. So, uh, well, in the wake of uh, uh, Alexander's, uh, you know, dictator dictatorship, well, the image of, of Princip was somehow, um, well, a little bit... Uh, I wouldn't say uh, 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 hidden, but he was not. Yes, yes, yes. He, he, he was no more the the big hero he had been pictured as in in uh, 1918. So this is this is really really uh, balanced. Uh, to uh, uh, Chaba's question, um, <coughs> I very much uh, uh, work on this kind of integrative uh, possibilities uh, in the Habsburg Empire, not only integration individuals through the army, through uh, the uh, civil servants, uh, through universities all around all around the empire, the integration power of the German language is also something to be uh, to be uh, uh, referred to, but we we also have to speak about integration of territories. So now nowadays in the post-colonial uh, times and and everything is post-colonial, you know, or is colonial. Everything is analyzed as uh, every, everyone practically was a colonial power. Okay, so if we analyze the Habsburg Empire through these uh, lenses, of course we could, we could say that Galicia, Bukovina, and Bosnia-Herzegovina were somehow the inner, inner Coloni co uh, colo colonial uh, uh, projects uh, of the of the Habsburg Empire, but at the same time, it was also integration of these territories through the railways, through uh, uh, higher education, through the army. So there was, of course, one, let's say, colonial project that pretended to make of these territories uh, um, uh, meaningful elements of the whole 
project of the M of the imperial project, but there was uh, quite a lot of integration uh, uh, projects uh, as well. So this is a very interesting uh, topic to be to be maybe to be developed, and th there are also many works, you know, Andrea Komloshi and all this uh, uh, binnen colonisation and uh, and the like. But that's a very very uh, uh, interesting and stimulating uh, uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you for uh, these challenging questions. Um, the uh, first one is um, about um, uh, nation, nationalism, and um, pluralism. And well, the the interesting thing uh, there, I, I didn't have uh, any time to um, refer them uh, to. Um, uh, very uh, close friends, uh, Miss Dearly, one is um, Erhard Gusek, the other one is uh, George Schöpflin, um, uh, their memory. And, and the, uh, the uh, Erhard, uh, in his recent uh, book with Blix, mm -hmm. talks about uh, how Central Europe is important for uh, European future of Europe. And I think w what he means there is essentially that, uh, and he, he has a long reference to 19th century sociology, the uh, individualism versus communitarianism, mm -hmm. um, the um, community, society, and, and so on. Um, <coughs> there, he is really talking about pluralism of communities uh, that does not exist in Western Europe for whatever reasons, so there is a tendency to recall that as a linear development from community to society. And, uh, uh, but he says uh, in the book that uh, there, there is the reverse as well. It's a, uh, it's a circle that uh, if, if there is only uh, society, then there is also anomi and uh, a, uh, a pull back to uh, community. Uh, that is an important point, and I think uh, the uh, ultimately what uh, he and Blix are arguing there is that uh, West Western Europe can uh, learn uh, to to deal, particularly the politicians have to deal with this uh, circular motion and not you know, uh, going from uh, community to society uh, with uh, any kind of reverse is, um, is um, uh, uh, retrogressive. Now, when it uh, comes to uh, this, uh, the, the Ottoman uh, situation, uh, there, there is a, um, there is particularly because of the current government there, um, th there is a reinterpretation out of ignorance of Ottoman history. Um, and uh, this uh, Ottoman history is uh, supposed to be a sort of a paradise of uh, a, a pluralist society with uh, different ethnic groups uh, living together and so on and so forth. What is missing there is, uh, is cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism is integration. And in the Ottoman period, there was no integration. They all had their spaces. In fact, uh, the Ottomans liked sort of a, a, a spatial order. They allocated <coughs> different ethnic and, and linguistic groups, different, uh, uh, different trades, uh, different professions, and different areas to live in. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, you had to be uh, Bulgarian in order to uh, deal with dairy products. If you were not Bulgarian, <laughs> you were not allowed to deal with dairy products. 
um, uh, you, you had to be a uh, you had to be a Jew in order to be a surgeon of the Janissary army. <laughs> if you were an ethnic Turk, you could not be. <laughs> so uh, th that is a different concept, and it is certainly not an integrative concept. Now, uh, what happened was, um, and, and, and this is still uh, very much a part of uh, 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 sort of psychological problem uh, with uh, Turkey, the dismemberment of the empire. Well, as that dismemberment was coming, everybody was seeing that. When you talk about the Eastern question. What is the Eastern question? You know, what are we going to do with the remnants of the Ottoman Empire if they cannot uh, you know, protect that? So, uh, as was mentioned, the Crimean War was part of it, but after that, the uh, 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 1877, uh, uh, the <laughs> Russian armies came to where the uh, Ataturk airport was uh, in Istanbul, and, and that, that was it. So uh, there is a, a more uh, Eastern question. Uh, there is a uh, there is how uh, there is a policy of containment that uh, nobody is willing to uh, basically commit again. Uh, to a uh, big campaign uh, there, um, and, and uh, so on. In that period, uh, there was, among the Turkish intelligentsia, there was a, um, a discussion of how to save this empire. Was it going to be westernization? Was it going to be uh, a, 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 in a Islamic Turkey? Uh, uh, or was it going to be a national Turkey? Uh, three policies. It was a book of three policies, and, and that was discussed. Now, what happened was that the Ottoman Empire really did not go down the drain mm -hmm. after the First World War. Ottoman Empire ceased to exist as far as uh, I'm concerned, and, and anyone who has read that part of the history, it, Ottoman Empire ceased to exist after the Balkan War. 1913, it was finished. And so, uh, what the, the translation, basically, from... Um, from the Ottoman to the nation state was not a planned move anymore, but nothing else was left. And, and so there is, there is a, a problem that the, the, um, there was a, uh, basically you lost the space, you lost what were the different uh, ethnic groups, uh, they, were, they may or may not have uh, had minority status, but after the 18, uh, 1856 uh, reforms, they, had, uh, they, uh, they were not considered minorities anymore, but the trust was gone. And, and uh, so that was, in fact, uh, <laughs> balkanization of, of, the, of the empire. Uh, balkanization of the empire <laughs> before uh, before the, the complete demise of the empire. I, d I don't know whether that perspective is uh, in uh, any way um, is is uh, helpful to. Balkanization is divine. Sorry, sorry. Maybe it's different in different divisions of the what is balkanization. So let us give the floor <laughs> first to Gabo. Yeah. Yes. If yeah, you are done, if you are no, done. no, no, I, I, I have to go I, to the I, station. Uh, there was a, there was a, a yeah. uh, the, the question about um, em, empire um, uh, was uh, an important uh, question, but I only meant by empire, not empire uh, generically, but I meant by empire the Holy Roman uh, Empire, which is a unique construct and, and what uh, that has given. I also have an answer to you, <laughs> if, if I may, yeah, yeah. if I may take this uh, 
Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is better. All right. Um, you said, what about uh, a democracy that calls for uh, repeated elections? Well, I mean, political leadership um, can, uh, if it is called political leadership rather than doing nothing, um, political leadership would take an initiative. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, uh, the political class today uh, is a, there is a problem with the political class today of um, <clears throat> trying to weaken uh, the institutions. The idea of political uh, leadership is that uh, it uh, the, the 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 leader uh, basically initiates a treaty, in the case of European, EEC, EC, EU, they're all treaties, and then they're institutionalized. So you do not need a uh, long political leadership. Some of them are long. I mean, Merkel was there uh, for a long time. Uh, they could be reelected, uh, uh, but uh, Political leadership is uh, can only initiate, and it does. The, uh, the the legacy is institutionalization, mm -hmm. and, and that institutionalization is then supported by the judiciary uh, if there is a deviation. Now, unfortunately, that essential aspect of democracy, which is not election. Election is a regular part of democratic process, but it is not the, the core of democracy. The core of democracy is stability through legislation and treaties that are guarded by the judiciary. And um, we are uh, uh, facing very serious questions that are ba basically eroding this, Trump is eroding uh, the, 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 uh, the institutions. Does, he does not like institutions. He would, uh, he would uh, basically close the State Department. And then where, where is stability? Uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are leaders uh, close to this geography who also uh, are, are doing this. So we are, uh, in fact, uh, facing a, a, a crisis. But l l let us not forget the basic principles of, uh, of this process of institutionalization of anything uh, new, and the guardianship of those institutions are the judiciary. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, yes, you are right. I'm, I'm quite very skeptical, and I'm a historian, not uh, not involved in social engineering. But I have I had ten minutes to to think about solving the problems of one thousand years. So I, I managed to find five solutions. First, first is welfare, raising standards of living while decreasing inequalities together. The second one is uh, getting rid of traumatized societies, which means at least two generations living in peace, so 60 years without any war. The third one is, I guess it is given in many districts of the Balkan Peninsula, it is demographic decline. It's a good solution to, to hinder uh, escalation of conflicts. Um, the f fourth solution is a political one, uh, political restrictions on chauvinism. It is a matter of decision and a matter of time. And the fifth one, uh, I'm not very proud for this, because I'm a historian, uh, you may write new history books focusing on coexistence, cooperation, 
uh, we, during the 60 years without war. And you will get a new society, I hope. So uh, if you lie, you can achieve some progress, I guess. But I'm not sure. Uh, to the question of common history books, I, I'm very happy to hear that there that at least for Yugoslavia, there's a common textbook. Uh, is it extended beyond the boundaries of uh, Yugoslavia, including Bulgaria or Greece, or it is focusing on the Yugoslavian st state? I think it's focused on ex Yugoslavia because it's a project of record. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it's only both countries. So, oh. so Macedonia, <laughs> Bulgaria, Greece, Albania is not included. What a pity. Uh, but anyway, uh, thinking about national history writing, uh, when I was a young beginning scholar, I had to wrote some pages about the latest uh, Bulgarian history book published in Hungarian language, which was very short. It contained only 100 pages. 50 of the pages dealt with uh, medieval Bulgaria, and 50 pages dealt with uh, Bulgaria after 1878. Uh, the 400 years of Ottoman rule was summarized in four pages, uh, and three of the four pages contained a list of uh, revolutionary activities, uh, activists uh, who fought against the Ottomans. So I guess this is not the solution to get acquainted with uh, the history of a Balkan nation. And finally, for the question of the Holy Crown, um, we wrote a letter to the Bulgarian colleagues and uh, some of my colleagues who, who speaks fluently Hungarian, Penko Pajkowska, asked the director of the National Museum and he replied that uh, the selection was made on the basis that uh, the Bulgarian crown must have been a, a closed crown similar to the Hungarian one, and everybody knows that the Hungarian crown has Eastern origin, Byzantine origin. So these two reasons, these two arguments, made it possible to put uh, the Hungarian crown on Samuel's head. Okay, but uh, uh, as, as I was informed, there's no official uh, painting or picture of, the, of Samuel's crown. Thank you very much. So, in so according to the schedule that we have, we should be done by now. So, because it's five thirty, let me give one single small thought about common history books. I have been involved in some common history books. Uh, I know there is a huge UNESCO venture, History of the World. I don't know how many of you have ever used the uh, UNESCO History of the World that was published in several languages uh, with a tremendous amount of uh, expenses. Another experience of mine is uh, about 15 years ago, the Czech, the Slovak, the Polish, and the Hungarian academies decided to write a common history of Central Europe, and I was asked by the president of the Hungarian Academy to represent Hungary in this wonderful project. And we had a meeting, and we got a matrix from the organizers. But what you should do? History should be divided into centuries. Let us start with the 9th century and go up to the 20th century. And let us have four aspects, political history, economic history, social history, and cultural history. The task is you find for each item. So uh, Slovak political history in the 13th century. So this is how the whole project should be organized. And uh, this should be the common history. And I was the only one who protested Again, this and then the president of this academy came to Budapest. Again, I was asked to present, and Sylvester Vizi was at that time the president of the academy. And fortunately, he supported me, saying that this is something that you cannot implement. I would, I said, I would be delighted to get together some experts from the region to discuss how such a book could be written, but it is very unlikely. And perhaps one minute, we had a shared experience with Catherine, and this is whether 
there is anything that can be done in the spirit of, of Europe. Ten years ago, we decided to organize a big, 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 big conference in Sarajevo to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. I consider this as a task the greatest challenge of my career. So I decided that there will be a number of leading European politicians, outstanding historians, and the conclusion will be the First World War is history and not politics anymore. Already, at the, it, the preparations were also a disaster, but already at the opening session it came to a terrible exchange between Bosnian and Serbian colleagues. So unfortunately, it, uh, we, we still we held the conference, it was a big conference, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So historians occasionally have to face challenges and have to admit that they cannot do too much. I still would have had much to say, but I am a disciplined person, and I know that if it is once 5.30, you have to finish at 5.35, uh, and thank you very much for being here.